Okay, I think we're rolling for electrolyte imbalances. It's recorded. So if you need to if you need to run out real quick. Okay, and I had this on the first slide, but you want to remember the major electrolytes. Things like sodium, potassium. Hydrogen is one that wasn't on the first slide, but what's hydrogen ion represent? Every time you see this, you should think acid, right. So and I always put C A plus plus Q plus, like I heard somebody saying. So sodium, potassium, calcium, hydrogen. All of these are called cations. And the way I always remember the difference between a cation and an ion is you know what I'm stressing. It's the T that looks like a what? A plus sign. Yeah, if it's a cation, it has a plus sign on it. Everything else are anions. The plus signs are positively charged, which means something came along and stole one of their negative electrons. Which if you ever take chemistry, sometimes it's a challenge to remember it. You lose a negative electron, which makes the thing more positive because it's lost a little bit of negativity. Anions are usually the things that steal that electron. So what would this be? Chloride. Yeah. You better remember what that is? Bicarbonate, like right. And then the phosphate. So these have an extra electron. When you bring a sodium and a chloride together, one has an extra electron, one's missing electron, and they bump into each other and then make each other happy. What do you make when you put sodium and chloride together? Salt, yeah, table salt. Sometimes you have to be careful because some chemicals will actually stick together. Like if you take um, calcium and you put it with bicarbonate, it makes something called calcium bicarbonate, which is chalk. So if you gave somebody a solution of like um, calcium chloride, so an IV solution of calcium chloride, and you also gave them an IV solution that has something like sodium bicarbonate, which sodium bicarbonate your body actually makes. If you put those together, they'll mix a little bit, You'll make calcium bicarbonate. And what are you making in their blood? Chalk. You're actually making chalk in their blood. Not a good idea. You get a little ticked about that. Actually, they are usually not conscious about that. In fact, they're usually not conscious at all. But you sometimes you have to be careful with these different ions. Things that are positive have a tendency to like things that are negative. Things that are positive usually have a tendency to not like things that are up. Other things that are positive. All right, and then some of the non-electrolytes. What do you notice about all these things? They are missing a charge. None of them have a charge. So things like urea, glucose, oxygen, CO2. Where would water fall? Water wouldn't be in any of these, actually. Because water has a slight negative pole. It has a little bit of a positive and a little bit of a negative. So which one's it attracted to? The positive or the negative? Both, right. The positive charge of water is attracted to this negative anion, and the negative part of water is attracted to the cation. And that's why water will bind to any of these different things, which makes water the perfect solvent. And then I already pointed out those are uncharged. When you look at the concentrations in the body, you can see that you have extracellular versus intracellular. Extracellular, huge in sodium abundance. If you took fizz with me, I always told you to think of the cell with what's surrounding the cell. It's a little island in a saltwater ocean. Right. So what's the other ion or electrolyte that's going to be high with sodium? Chloride, right. So salt water, remember the sodium and the chloride. See high sodium and then high chloride over here. Both in the extracellular fluid. Look at them in the look at them in the intracellular. Really low intracellular. But what's going to be huge inside of the cell? Potassium. Potassium is almost as high as the sodium is, except where they're at is different. One's outside the cell or one's inside the cell. When they're like this, if this was carrying a positive charge and this was carrying a positive charge, they help keep that balance, that electrical neutrality. So there's something else to think about. And then, sorry, all the other ones were listed on here too, like magnesium and chloride and bicarbonate, they're all on there too. We already talked about this. What's the magic number? How many particles per liter should you be looking for? About 300, right. So whether it's salt or sugar or whatever, you're looking for roughly 300 particles per unit. About, if I give you an isotonic solution, what percent salt is it? It's 0.9%, so just under 1%. Now let's talk about each of the ions and what you have to remember. So these are the things you should know about sodium. And like I said, I set these up. So that if you were looking at your notes and you took just a note card and you were asking yourself the question, you could 
start with the top of the note card and say, what should I know about sodium? And you can just, in your mind, list the things you, you should know. This one, if you've taken any kind of clinical courses, then you probably know this, but this salute, or this percentage or number that I'm putting up here is always in the extracellular fluid. Why would I always give you numbers of the extracellular fluid, like blood? Because that's what you can measure, right? So you're actually, you can take a blood sample out and you say, what part of sodium is it? And it shows up 136 and 145, you know they're normal. So the keys, number one, is this the primary extracellular fluid, cation, which means it has what charge? Positive. It's the bulk of the electrolytes in the blood and the interstitial fluid. Next are the physiological roles, and in physiology, we beat you to death with sodium. Because sodium helps regulate water. Where the sodium goes, water flows. Yeah. So it chases it. It actually has more power, it's more powerful at moving water than protein does. It likes to pair up with things like chloride, bicarbonate. Why? Because it's positive and they are negative. Yeah. You're like, fine. Here you have sodium bicarbonate, which you talk about in the GI tract a lot, to neutralize acids. Here you have sodium chloride, which you put on your table. You shake on your food, make it delicious. And then nerve conduction. We talk about sending the action potential down the neuron, down the axon. We talk about what two ions moving back and forth. Sodium and potassium. Right. It's sodium and potassium that are affecting it. So when you have this action potential, you've got the sodium controlling the, the uh, depolarization, you have the potassium controlling the depolarization. And I put this little picture in the middle because you can see the exchange of the ion and the neuron. Sodium needs to be present for you to fire electrons. So is it good to be low in sodium? No, is it good for you to be high in sodium? No, you want to be <laughs> nice and level. <laughs> One pretzel level just spoke out. <laughs> but yeah, you want to keep it balanced because if you put too much sodium, I'm kind of foreshadowing what we're going to talk about, to put too much sodium in the environment, and sodium causes an action potential to happen, what's going to happen to your nerves if you have too much sodium in your blood? They over-fire. What happens if you have too little? They under-fire, right? So what would be the symptoms if you over-fire neurons? Twitchy, anxious, excitable, right? They're on edge. If you're over-firing your brain, it's like a kid that's eating way too much sugar. They're hyperactive. So if you have too little sodium and you're not able to fire the neurons properly, if you need to process a thought and you can't fire the neurons, how are you going to look? You're going to look... Like, you're dumbed down, right? So you're going to look slow. You're going to have to think really slow about things. And if they turn too many down, what will happen to your consciousness? You pass out, and then you go into a coma, and if it's not correct, you'll actually die. So it's... When you understand the main physiological properties of these things, it helps you give an idea of what you can expect when they're out of sync, when they're out of balance. Right? So nerve conduction, it helps you fire nerves, it helps you contract a muscle. Actually, communication give that initial signal back to the muscle. So, if you have too much salt, what can happen to your muscles? They get twitchy. Yeah, they get excited too easily. These control the membrane. Sodium is being affected the membrane of both these structures, neurons and muscles. So, they're charging. They're electrifying the muscles. Helps control acid-base balance. So, when you're moving things like sodium, potassium, you're also moving charged things like acids, like bicarbonate. And then inside the cell, cellular, re cellular reactions and then a transport. If you can't move sodium, what other ion do you think you're not going to be able to move efficiently? Mm -hmm. Chloride's a good call, too. Think of that pump, potassium. And while we're on chloride, let's go on to the next slide. So the second one you want to think about is chloride. I put sodium and chloride together. Is it because they're both cations? No, it's because they usually flow together. So if I have a high abundance of sodium in one part of my body, I can expect to have a high part, high abundance of calcium. If I have low sodium, I can expect low calcium or chloride. <coughs> Dang it, I said calcium. Chloride, CO. Uh, one disease we're going to talk about in the next slide. If I can't move chloride from the outside surface of my body in, or I can't move it from my GI tract into my body, what else is going to hang out on the surface of my skin with chloride? Sodium, right? If I were to lick my skin, what would it taste like? Salty, like table salt, right? Another thing is that if I have a lot of sodium and chloride out here, what's going to be attracted to it? 
water. If I have a lot of sodium chloride on the inside lining of my GI tract, what's going to be attracting to it? Water. If I have a lot of that in my lungs, what's going to be attracting to it? Water. Anybody know what disease I'm talking about? Cystic fibrosis, right? Yeah. All right, so chloride, what do you have to know about it? Number one is it's an anion. Where's it most abundant? Where's, if you ever forget, where's sodium most abundant? Outside. What do you know about chloride? It goes hand in hand. So chloride's most abundant in the extracellular fluids. When you look at its amount, it's not exactly the same, but 97 to 105. And these, I would only pop questions like this out on, on um, like uh, homework assignments. You don't have to memorize the numbers for the test. This is just a quick reference guide for you. I said later down the road when you, if you want to use the stuff to study. And then the physiological role, it helps provide electrical neutrality. If I have 100 pieces of sodium with 100 positive charges, I want to try and keep it close to the same with these chlorides so that the positive charges don't get overwhelming. They're kind of neutralized or balanced out. The prime times you see this are red blood cells. I don't know how to say this without giving it away, but you remember that process where you switch bicarbonate and you switch chloride? It's called the chloride shift. Because when you're switching bicarbonate, bicarbonate has a negative charge. When you're shifting chloride at the same time, what's it have? Mm -hmm. So if you move one negative out of the red blood cell and one negative in, what happened to its electricity? Still neutral. Yeah. You add a negative and you take away a negative at the same time, it keeps it perfectly neutral. So when you're exchanging oxygen and CO2, you switch the chloride back and forth to keep it neutral. And they already told this, I already said this, but pairs with sodium. So chloride moves passively wherever sodium wants to go. When you look at bicarbonate, you want to think of it going inversely. What's that mean? Opposite way. Why would it go the opposite way of bicarbonate? Because if one negative charge is going one way, what do you want to do with the other one? Send it the other way. It keeps it neutral. Remember, chloride and sodium, one's negative and one's positive. If I bring in a chloride and I bring in a sodium, what happened to my electrical balance? They're the same. Yeah, they grounded each other out and they're fine. But if I move bicarbonate in one direction, I only move chloride the other way because of the negative charges. This is an important one. Remember, chloride, when we were talking about pain or in the physiology class, when we talked about pain, it was there for nerve inhibition. It worked with opiates. So opiates open up chloride channels and they go into a cell and they neutralize. They do what to the cell's membrane potential? Do they depolarize, repolarize, or hyperpolarize it? It hyperpolarizes it. It makes it harder for you to fire. So it can actually inhibit nerve. So what kind of mental symptom would you see with somebody that has hyperchloremia? Too much chloride in their blood. Slowed mental processes. What else would you see if they have high chlorine? They'd also have high sodium. What would you say might happen? I said that backwards, didn't I? I'll fix that in a second. Let's keep that. Acid base balance. <laughs> With acid base balance, you want to think of H plus and K plus with this. And I'll show you when we get into What is H plus again? Acid. And what was K plus? Potassium. And then the second time you want to think of it is when you're moving HCl. So you've got the H plus, which sticks to the chloride. What is this now? Hydrochloric acid. Yeah. Hydrochloric acid. And then here was the first disease, so cystic fibrosis. When you think about it, here's your cell membrane. The chloride pumps are broken, so I should say the chlorine transporters are broken. So can you move chlorine efficiently? Nope. If chlorine wants to stay out here, what's going to try and keep with it? It's best buddy sodium. So it's going to hang out with the chlorine and sodium. If sodium's hanging out out here, what's going to hang out with the sodium? The water. So you start getting this thick, watery mucus. What's happening to the distance between, well, in the lungs, oxygen and the cell? You have this thick mucousy layer. You got oxygen way up here. What's happening to the diffusion layer? It's slowing it down. So what's going to be one symptom of cystic fibrosis when you're talking about the lungs? They have a problem breathing. Yeah, they have a problem breathing. Plus, it's getting so thick. What else could hang out in there? 
Bacteria, yeah. Debris, bacteria can hang out in there. That's why they did the whole depotament where they're tapping the back and they're trying to loosen the stuff up so they can cough it up in the plant or swallow it in their stomach and get rid of it. And then when they, in the olden days, to help diagnose this, and this is like old, old days, they would kiss the baby and the baby tasted salty. Yeah, they knew it had this thing, cystic fibrosis. After we got beyond licking other people and we grew out of that, it's like back in the old days, to move stuff for a pipette in a, in a microbiology lab, you actually sucked the stuff up into the pipette and then moved it. Gross. What if you were talking to somebody not paying attention you sucked that right up into you? Don't worry, that's just a bow eye. You'll get over it. In fact, it would actually mouth pipette this stuff back and forth. But when they grew out of using your mouth on other people to do tests, they actually would take electrodes and put it on their skin. And if it carry electricity really well because of the electrolytes, and then you have cystic fibrosis. But cystic fibrosis, we're going to talk about in genetics. It's a genetic disorder that you get from who? You catch it? Nope, you're born with it, so you got it from mom and dad. All right, so while we're talking about sodium chloride, you need to pay attention to sodium regulation. I hope you remember this process. Anybody remember the name of this thing? The renin and Yerkinson aldosterone system. And I'm not going to spend a ton of time going back through it again, but you really have to remember it. it's a super important process for disease states, for normal physiology, for, uh, for uh, pharmacology. It's in one of the main outcomes of this is a change in blood pressure. Is high blood pressure a problem in the country? Absolutely. So we make drugs that affect this process specifically to try and affect blood pressure. So you just sort of remember the different parts, like renin. Where's renin released from? What organ? The kidneys. When you have what? High or low blood pressure? Low. Because what's the final outcome of renin? To raise your blood pressure. So renin goes out and it activates this stuff called angiotensin. Okay. Angiotensin 1. Where's angiotensin 1 turn into angiotensin 2, the powerful stuff? The lungs. You remember the name of the enzyme? ACE. Yep, ACE. ACE. Because if you take an ACE inhibitor, it blocks that conversion. So once it's activated in angiotensin 2, you see all the different ways it goes. It goes to the kidneys, and it causes you to re or retain water, basically. Squeeze on those HR arterioles so that you can't release water as well. It goes to the adrenal gland and makes what chemical? We already talked about Aldosterone. What's that do? It goes to the kidney and makes you retain salt. Yeah, sodium. So this angiotensin goes to the blood vessels, causes constriction. It goes to the hypothalamus and tells you to start doing what? To raise your blood pressure. Drink. Yeah, water. Or water. And then, or liquidy things, to raise your blood pressure. Yep. So it's all of these other effects to overall try and raise your blood pressure. So why was aldosterone released? Because your blood pressure went down. Yep. Remember this stuff, A and P? Why is it released? Because your blood pressure is too high. So aldosterone and A and P, they work exactly the opposite. Both of them regulate sodium. The only way they regulate water is indirectly. They regulate sodium directly. So aldosterone and A and P both control sodium. Aldosterone keeps the sodium in your body. A and P gets rid of it. I always think of A and P as a self-defense for what organ? Look where it's made. The heart. It's the heart going, oh my god, the pressure is so high. It releases this chemical. It says, get rid of the salt. It releases the salt, releases the water, lowers the blood pressure. It's like, oh, way better. If you don't remember, natriuretic sounds like what kind of word? A diuretic, which makes you lose water, right? So look at the Na+. Plus. NAT looks like Na+. Plus, so it's a sodium diuretic. It makes you really sodium. You have to remember that. And then this next slide I just put on here. This shows you each of the players in this. And I'm not going to read it through. You sound like you get the main ideas. Just remember what renin, angiotensin, angiotensin 2, and aldosterone are the main players. That's why they call it the renin, angiotensin, aldosterone system. And the same process, but we just walked through it. So, four prominent effects of fluid balance. So, number one. A, B, H comes from where? Where's it made? That's not in this life. Hypothalamus, right? It's made in the hypothalamus. It's released from the posterior pituitary 
When? When would you release ADH? If you need to increase water retention. Yeah, so <laughs> I was waiting for everybody to like randomly put the pieces together and we got there. So if you need to keep water because your blood pressure is low or because your what's too high? Sodium is too high, right? So if your solutes are too high, it makes you think, whoa, you know, there's not enough water, so you retain any water. ADH comes from hypothalamus and post pituitary to help you raise your blood volume slash pressure or to dilute solutes. The second one, renin, already talked about it, but renin is released from the kidney when your blood pressure is too low. Aldosterone is released from the adrenal gland because of what chemical? What releases it from the adrenal gland? I'll give you a hint. It's part of the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. Angiotensin. So it's in that order to renin to angiotensin to aldosterone. And then natriuretic hormones. In this first one, A and P is the one that you want to think about. Because that's the one they talk about the most. B and P is not talked about as much. This is brain natriuretic peptides. I'll give you a shiny nickel so you can figure out what releases it. <laughs> right, the brain. So they work exactly the same, except one comes from the atria, one comes from the brain. They both go down to the kidney and cause you to lose salt. So what must be happening in the brain that caused the brain to release this? <coughs> increased pressure, right. So increased blood pressure in the brain will cause that to happen. And then if you like pictures, there's your picture flow chart. So how do you regulate sodium? So while we're transitioning, what other chemical would aldosterone regulate? We already know it regulates sodium. What else does it regulate directly? Mm -hmm. So aldosterone goes to the kidney. It turns on a pump that moves sodium and potassium. Right. So potassium. If it's moving sodium in, where's potassium going? Out. Yep. So let's say I had low salt in my body, and I turn on lots of aldosterone. It raises the salt in my body. What's going to happen to potassium in my body? It's going to drop as a result. Yep. So as the potassium is going up, what's happening to the salt? Or as the potassium is going up, what's happening to the sodium? It goes down. Exactly. It's just the opposite. So when you see one starting to rise, you'll see the other one starting to drop. Right. And I just put that in. We're going to talk about potassium still, but just not yet. And I don't know how I found this. I don't even know what language that is. <laughs> but it was just kind of funny. I put a Sounds like angry. It must be German. <laughs> I guess I could always Google Translate it and figure, figure out what language it is. But we want to keep in mind these concentrations and water balance. And we already know these situations, hyper, hypo, and iso. You want to definitely remember what's happening in each of the situations. If it's isotonic, what osmolarity is it? Like milliosmoles. 300. What if I talk about um, saline solution? What kind of saline solution would be isotonic? Nine percent. Yeah. So we'll use that as a reference. So the first thing I want to ask is, how do you get an isotonic alteration? That means that you're losing fluids, but you're losing the amount of salt and water proportionally. How would you do that? Bleeding. Bleeding would be the first thing you want to think about. So if somebody has really low blood volume and you can't figure it out, and they're not bleeding on the surface, where would you take a guess at? Internal. And when we get to the GI tract, we'll talk about signs of internal bleeding. Make a look for it, or you can look for it. All right. So the key is it's total body water change, but it's proportional. The electrolytes are going down at the same rate that the water is going down. So proportionately, the osmoreceptors in the brain say, hey, everything's cool. What receptors would go crazy and say, not nah, everything's cool? Baroreceptors, mm -hmm. right? right? So losing plasma or losing the extracellular fluid, and I already talked about one thing that could cause that. So one cause could be bleeding out. Another could be excessive sweating. Yeah, excessive exercise. When you or what else? Excessive loss of a fluid. Urination. Because when you're sweating or you're urinating, you're urinating at water, electrolytes, so potassium, sodium, those good things. 
when you sweat, you're spreading the same stuff. You get some urea going out there, you have salt, potassium. So when you urinate, it's or sweat, it's almost like you just urinate it all over yourself. So avoid sweating; it's gross. Exercise is evil for that reason. I'm kidding. Okay, so some of the signs: extracellular volume drops, weight loss, dry skin. So it's dry skin. Why would their skin be dry if they're losing water? They're dehydrated, so what's happening to the water? It's being pulled into the blood to keep them alive, right? So it's sucking it, basically. It's pulling that water into the interstitial fluid, into the plasma, just to keep their blood dying up. So their skin starts getting dry. Think about the mucous membranes, everywhere you depend on water. Why would the urine output drop? Because the kidney is going to start retaining water. What's the name of the chemical that retains water? ADH. Yep, antidiuretic. So then the next thing you want to think about is the symptoms. So why would they have a fast heart rate? They're trying to move the blood faster. They have a decreased volume, which means they have to move more blood faster since they can't move that you know, regular amount. So if you move one liter of blood in a heartbeat, it's just an exaggerated example. But now you have less blood to get the same volume moving at the same rate, you're going to have to beat the heart faster. Why would they have flat in the neck veins? That's interesting. Less volume. Yeah, when you have normal volume, it's like having a water balloon at normal capacity. If you start draining some of the water, the balloon starts collapsing. Flat neck veins. Right, and then sometimes they can have normal or decreased blood pressure. Why could they have, how could they possibly have normal blood pressure? You need increased heart rate, exactly. So, because you increase heart rate. And then if their blood pressure does drop, though, then it can lead to shock. So those are the physical symptoms. Okay. So there's fluid loss or loss of decreased fluid. You don't have too much. Typically, it's because of this reason. If you drink a lot of water, is your body able to compensate? Yes. Yeah, you just make more trips to the urinal. Yeah. You know, you're going to have less urine. Yeah, you just make more trips to the new, right? So you're making a lot more trips to the bathroom to get rid of it. So typically when somebody has isotonic fluid excesses when you uh, choose them, or if they're trying to win a Wii or a car by not urinating, if you've never heard that story. Alright, another problem, it could be actually a hormone imbalance, like hypersecretion of aldosterone. What? Aldosterone controls what? Salt. Right, so sodium. So how is it controlling water? The water stays with it. Exactly. So by hypersecreting aldosterone, the salt level goes up. But the kidney stops secreting water, so the water level goes up too. It's isotonic solution. They're both going up simultaneously. Okay. And then some drugs like cortisol, oops, cortisone, which is the artificial version of what hormone your body makes. Cortisol. Now, cortisol acts kind of like, like an antidiuretic hormone. I kind of want to keep that in mind. Um, what do we have? Hypervolume. So if you get too much, then you have hypervolemia. And if you don't have to be severe, hyper means yep, bowel mm -hmm. means bowel means mm -hmm. blood. So you just get more blood. What's it going to do to the heart? More stress on the heart. So is it good to have isotonic fluid excess for very long? No. And then it can lead to edema because all that blood pressure now is going to start pushing the fluid into the tissue and you get that swelling. Mm -hmm. So those are the general symptoms that you see with it. But that's with everything being in balance. So the solute and the water being in balance. The next problem you can have is that you can have hypertonic. When you look at hypertonic, one of two things had to happen. Hypertonic is telling you literally what happened. Hyper, too much, tonic, solute. So either the solute went up or the water went down, right, so solute went down, because if I have a 300 pieces of solute in a liter of blood, but then I start sucking the, the water out of it, I didn't change the number of solute, but now I have a smaller you know, volume, which means it looks like I have more salt, so it's kind of a tricky concept, there are two ways you can get hypertonic situations, either you're getting too much salt in your body, or you're losing too much water, not plasma, isotonic but just specifically the water. Right, so, first, the too much solute, hypernatremia and hyperchloremia. Do you ever see those together? 
think about what I said a couple slides back. Yes, you usually see them hand in hand. Because where where sodium goes, what wants to stick with its buddy? Chloride. So usually they're kind of hand in hand. There are always exceptions to the rule, but in general you're going to see them go hand in hand. So we talked about the boundaries of the, the amounts that are normal. If you can have too much above, that's what the little alligators are. So you either had sodium gain or pure water loss. What could cause you to gain too much sodium or lose too much water? What could cause you to gain too much sodium? Your diet. Yeah. What hormone could be broken that causes you to keep too much aldosterone? What hormone could be broken that makes you lose too much water? Maybe Friday night drinking a little too much. ADH. Yeah, you go out on a Friday night and drink a little too much, the ADH doesn't work, and proof is gone. Um, let's see. How does water move between ECF and ICF? You already answered that. So a lot of these, even though there are questions like that, you already know the answer to the whole slide. So here's the big one. Why do they get hypervolemic symptoms? Look at the last slide. So hypervolemic symptoms. Weight gain. Increased metric, like metric, diluted plasma proteins, distended neck veins, bulging neck veins. Why would they have that if they get hyper? Because it's going to start trying to keep as much water as possible. So their blood volume is going to start going up, their blood pressure is going to go up, and it's going to look like they have too much volume. That's if they're raising their salt part. And then, of course, hypertonic is going to do what to their cells? Yep, so you get these intracellular dehydration. It's going to make your cells go. It's going to overexcite them. So, overexcite, have you ever seen someone go into a convulsion? It's like their muscles are in hyperdrive, right? So, think of it, it's overfiring these muscles. What muscle is that firing? Over firing here. Heart muscle. Yeah. What would you expect to happen to their skeletal muscles in general? Might be more twitchy, hyperactive. And then hyperchloremia. Like you said, it usually happens with hypernatremia. But here's on the other step. So, or we have low bicarbonate. Because remember, chloride's negative, bicarbonate's negative. So if you have high chloride, what would you expect with the bicarb? It would be low. So if I bring the bicarb low, you'd expect more chloride in this situation. Right? Usually it's secondary to something else, so it's usually one of the other situations. How could you lose a lot of bicarbonate? I know if you have some gallery, I talked about this in the GI tract. Diarrhea. Yeah. So in a situation like diarrhea, you might see more hyperchloremia. They're losing lots and lots of bicarbonate because it's going out to the other end. Okay. And then I just put a quick fix in here. So if your total body sodium goes up, you start drinking, you start sucking the water out of the cells, which makes the cells shrivel. You get too much salt, you're dehydrating them. And you can see the process happen. A and H is the same as A and P. I hate that they do that. It's atrial nitriac hormone or atrial nitriac peptide. Most people that teach out of the A and P, of course, most of them don't always do that. But it's the same thing. Okay. So that was too much solute. Now you have to do a little solvent, and it's still the same situation. It's still hyper. So, hypernatremia or hyperchloremia. And you already know this, and in case you didn't, since the slide didn't transition properly, I kind of ruined the whole thing. What's the universal solvent? Hmm. Let me think about that. Right next door, the so water. So, what could cause you to lose too much solvent, too much water? Just water. Think of a hormone. Something like, yeah. What? Too much or too little ADH? Too little ADH. Yeah. What else? Don't think of it as just losing it, but what would cause an imbalance? Lack of intake. 
Yeah, so lack of dr- drinking enough water. Because you're constantly going to breathe and you're losing water out whether you like it or not. So you're always losing water, you can be taking it in. Yeah. And then the symptoms, if it's too little solvent, if the volume starts decreasing dramatically. So hypovolemic symptoms. So the heart starts beating a little bit faster. So we saw a tachycardia when we were talking about hypernutrition. It's just a different cause. So symptoms can sometimes overlap. And then weak pulse, why would you have a weak pulse? Because you have very little volume. Would you would you expect the uh, veins to be pushing out or flattened? Flattened. And then why would you have a higher hematocrit? So why would you have higher red blood cell count? Yep. So the red blood cells are the same number, it's just that the volume of blood decreased. So hematocrit is a percentage. It's the number of red blood cells based on the percentage of volume. Hyponatremia, exactly the opposite. So pretty much if you know one way, then you just reverse it. The symptoms come out the opposite. The cause is usually the opposite. So with hyponatremia, you're looking for a decrease in osmolarity. So decrease number of solutes. What could cause that? Think about sodium first. So look at the sodium specifically, not the water. But if you have hyponatremia, what could be happening? Excessive sweating. What chemical gets rid of sodium from you? Too much A and P? Yep. Or B and P? Yep. So too much of either A and P or B and P? What else could you not be doing? Not proper intake. Let's say you're exercising really hard and you're drinking pure water. There's your lack of intake. You're not getting enough electrolytes in. And then, like you said, it's pretty much the opposite of what you've seen before. In this situation, so it's hyponatremia, <coughs> you're going to look at hypoglomic symptoms. They don't have enough salt, so what are they not able to retain with that salt? The water. Their blood volume goes down, and they have hypovolemic symptoms. And then, free water excess, so drinking way, way too much water, this would cause hypervolemia because they have too much water. What happens is their blood pressure. It increased. What would happen to their ability to move electrolytes efficiently? Could they do that? No, the electrolytes aren't going to move properly. They actually get into a water intoxication, which is really, really rare. I'm still waiting to find the real source for that lady that drank too much water and killed herself. Oh, that was the Boston Marathon. That was me. You did that? Yeah, yeah. Oh. That's like two or three people and I was probably like eight years ago. Hmm. Hey, yeah, New York City, did they have the marathon? Did they ever... They did have the marathon. Oh, no, no. Because they bumped it because of the... Yeah. Uh, but they never... They didn't have a do-this-later type of rain no. check thing? No. Oh. Yeah, I bet. I, you probably know I don't have a TV, so I hear about all this stuff, like, if I just happen to flip into a radio channel, and I heard about it the day before, and everybody was giving them stress. Okay, so causes for water excess, just compulsive water drinking, drinking way too much water. What kind of people do you think would be doing that, just compulsive water drinking? It's funny because a lot of times you see it in people that are trying to lose weight. They just keep drinking more and more water. Like bulimics will do that a lot. They drink a lot of water to try and like push off their appetite. Um, trying to think of other situations. People in a warm environment could possibly do that. People that are normally not in a warm environment, but they get in a warm environment, you can forcibly keep drinking. Right, decreased germ formation, who would that be? People that have what kind of failure? Yeah, kidney failure. And then, a disease, when you see the disease name, you draw a point out to you, but here's one you want to know. Syndrome of inappropriate ADH. S-I-A-D-H. They couldn't think of a better name, so there it is. But they're making way too much antidiuretic hormones, so what's happening? Are they urinating a lot or not? Well, look at the line right above it. No. Not. So they're retaining all that water. That water is diluting everything in their body. So where would you probably have a tumor if you had some syndrome of inappropriate ADH? You could have it in the hypothalamus or the pituitary. 
the other way that people get sometimes SI eighty eight is if if you have a hormone, what do you always have to have for a hormone to work? Receptors. So the receptors that get stuck on, things like they're always working. Okay. And then some of the problems with water excess, and we'll talk about this when we get into the brain, but things like cerebral edema. Too much fluid. Your brain's super sensitive to fluid. So it's backing up, getting in there, and it causes all kinds of problems. So symptoms like headaches, misfiring neurons, which cause muscle twitching, and then weight gain, because just pouring all that extra water away. What would you expect to happen to their urine concentration? Trying to fix this. Extremely concentrated or dilute? Very dilute. And then common hypotonics. Ugh. Common hypotonic alterations. Um, hypotonics is decreased solutes. So what could also happen? Oh, we already, didn't we already talk about this? So we just talked about it. Because you can either have decreased solute or you can have increased solvent. Hmm. Interesting. I don't know how to accidentally pop two of the same slide up there. Okay, and maybe I didn't. Yeah, I did. Yeah, there's SIADH is on there again. Okay, and then clinical manifestations of hyponatremia. So, hypernatremia, they're what the neurons? Too much sodium causes the neurons to start firing rapidly. If you don't have enough sodium, what's going to happen to the neurons? You can't fire them. So, what's going to happen to their thought processes? Quick. Slow down. Yeah, they start getting lethargic, sleepy. They get more headaches. They start getting into a confused state, which we'll talk about in the nervous system. What what does confused actually mean? They get slow reflexes. They'll have seizures, slip into a coma, and then they die. And it's all because of this moving in action potential. If you don't have the proper sodium to depolarize the neuron, it doesn't depolarize. So you have to have enough salt. And then with the muscles, weakness, fatigue, why? The surface of the muscle depends on action potential too, just like a neuron does. It needs the sodium. If you don't get that, it doesn't fire properly. And then GI symptoms, nausea, vomiting, abdominal cramps, it's the same thing. It's an imbalance. You can't move things properly. You can't turn on pumps. You can't regulate. So kind of a review slide. When you look at hypernatremia causes and the, the problems that come about from it, and then hyponatremia. What other sim what other problem do you usually see with hypernatremia? Hyperchloremia. Yep. And then of course hyponatremia will be common with hypochloremia. And then you see the same things. And in this situation, see if you got the concept. Where's the fluid going here? So this is a cell, this is plasma, where are we going to go? So this is talking about, this 300 is talking about what? The number of solutes. So in this situation, if we just round up to a 4 liter, and we say there's a 1,000 particles here. This has 700 water particles, this one has 690 water particles, where are we going to go? He wants to go to the plasma. Because the plasma is what compared to the cell? Hypo or hyper? It's hyper. What's the cell going to do in a hyper situation? Shrink like a raisin. Yep. And then I put a couple situations in here. But silly me, I also put the answers right in your notes. So I'll let you go through them later. Mm -hmm. I did, right? The right in the slides. Yeah, so it says, oh no, and then the next slide says solution. Oh no again, solution. Yeah, sometimes I don't think before I hit print. All right, so intracellular electrolytes. What's the main intracellular electrolyte? Potassium. Yeah, so it's going to be potassium. And what you need to know about potassium, number one, it's the major intracellular fluid electrolyte. And when I put this up here, this should actually, above this, your intracellular concentration, or ICF. 
Look how high this is. That's actually higher than sodium is. But sodium is outside the cell, right? This is inside the cell. Can you measure this? No, that's why it's in brackets. The number you want to pay the most attention to is this one, because this one's what you're going to measure for plasma. So when you think of plasma salt, uh, plasma sample, you're going to look for the ECF concentration. It's going to be really, really, really low. Three and a half to four and a half. Where is potassium primarily? Outside or inside the cell? So if I see a spike in my blood potassium, what could have happened to the cells? Yep, if you lice the cell, if you break the cell, like muscle cells. If you smash your arm and you destroy a bunch of the muscle cell, and I take a sample of your blood right afterwards, I see a spike in potassium because it just poured out from those damaged cells. If somebody has a heart attack and you just destroy a bunch of heart muscle, then you see a rise in potassium because of that same thing. But can you distinguish if it was heart muscle versus leg muscle that got hurt? No. Potassium is potassium either way. Right, so what do you re need to remember about potassium? Is it there for what phase? Repolarization. In cardiac or skeletal muscle? Both. In muscle or axons? Both, right? So, um, in physiology, if you notice the pattern, repolarization is always dependent on potassium. No matter what kind of cell you have, it's always dependent on potassium. So potassium is responsible for bringing things back into balance. When potassium moves, what kind of, what will the pump also move? Sodium. There's another type of pump that is actually a hydrogen potassium pump. They both have exactly the same charge. So if one goes into the cell, what's the other one going to do? Go into the cell with it? Go out. Why? To keep it balanced. The same idea with the chloride and bicarbonate. When chloride goes one way, the bicarbonate goes the other. When hydrogen goes one way, potassium goes the other. When sodium goes one way, in A plus, potassium goes the other. This is this is where it gets kind of complex because you've got all these ions like acid and potassium and sodium all have the same charge. When one sh one sh one shoves its way into a cell, the other ones get uncomfortable and they'll have to start leaving. They'll have to start shuffling themselves so everything seems kind of balanced. So let's go through the big ideas you can look at. Okay. So ECF potassium is regulated. How is it regulated? What chemical do you already know regulates potassium? What hormone? I'll give you a hint. It also regulates sodium. Aldosterone. Yep. Aldosterone. So that's one chemical is aldosterone. Another one that most people don't think about is insulin. Insulin actually pulls potassium into the cells. So you eat a big bowl of jelly beans, what's going to happen to your potassium level? Well, what's going to happen to your sugar level? It goes up, insulin comes out and does what with the sugar? Pulls it down into the cell, what's going to get pulled into the cell with it? Potassium. Yep. So at the rate you see the sh blood sugar start dropping, you'll actually see a flux in the potassium start dropping too. So if somebody takes too much insulin, other than being hypoglycemic, what other problem might they have? Hyper or hypokalemic? Hypokalemic. Is potassium important? Yes. So it's important for rebalancing or re rebalancing, repolarizing things. Right? So what happens to K plus in type 1 diabetes? What's type 1? They make too much? They make too little? The receptors don't work? They make too little insulin. So what's going to happen to the potassium levels in their blood? It's going to increase because they can't pull it into the cells like normal. Okay. Second thing that pulls it into the blood, catecholamine. What's a catecholamine? What's a good example? If you can't remember, a beta-2 agonist would be a catecholamine. Mm, tricky, tricky. Catecholamines are epinephrine, norepinephrine, dopamine. So you want to think epinephrine. So you get a big shot of epinephrine. It's going to start pulling that potassium in. It could potentially cause hypokalemia. 
and then the last one I already talked about. So it gets excreted from the body because of aldosterone, which turns on that sodium potassium pump. Brings up your sodium, brings down your potassium. And then situations like this cause something called hypokalemic periodic paralysis. People can't move their muscles efficiently. Why would potassium affect a muscle? What, what is it affecting about a muscle? The repolarization abilities. Yep. It makes it hard for you to change that polarity. With, with too much insulin? Yep. After, after the insulin spike, then you have that massive drop. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. Mm -hmm. It might make you feel kind of more lazy than that one of these The real reason you feel lazy is because you have that insulin sucking all the sugar out of your blood. But that's interesting. I almost want to put somebody through the test now. Give two people a big bag of jelly beans, and then when they come to that crashing point, make them run down the hall really hard. See if they can do it. <laughs> If they can't, then we know that that's also a symptom. Okay. And then this is kind of an important one that a lot of people don't pay attention to, too. And think about diabetics. What's that problem that diabetics have with acid levels? Abbreviated DKA. Diabetic ketoacidosis. Right, so DKA. You want to be careful because changing the pH affects the potassium, and changing the potassium can also affect the pH. So if my blood is becoming too acidic, what do I want to do with acids? Get them out. So if I push them out of the body, oops, I thought it was that slide. There we go. Down here in the bottom corner. If I'm pushing the acid out of my body, what am I retaining a lot more of? Potassium. So it's going to throw off my potassium balance. So we're easier to switch. There we go. So if hydrogens accumulate inside the blood, it's going to actually shift potassium out. And then when that process shifts back around, it takes the hydrogen out, potassium comes in. So it's kind of a tricky balance. And with people with, with diabetes, now you've got two chemicals that are screwing with the potassium levels. You have, what was the first one we talked about? Diabetics. Insulin. And the second one is going to be the acid levels. And then to try and bring that back and attract it and release things like aldosterone, insulin, and epinephrine. Because all three of these things are doing what? What was aldosterone doing with fasting? Taking it out of the blood to try and maintain the balance. What's insulin doing? So this one's kicking it into the kidney to urinate it. What's insulin doing? Pulling it into the cell so it's out of the blood. What's epinephrine doing? Also pulling it into the cells. So you're trying to maintain that the blood level of potassium. When you start screwing with the acid base balance, you can either get rid of it out of the body or you can hide it inside the cells and the germ. Do you get I missed that one. Epinephrine is also pointing inside the cells. Yep, insulin and epinephrine do the same thing. So you're trying to hide it inside the cells to bring them potassium levels back to balance. Okay. And then hypokalemia is when the blood potassium level is too low. And then potassium balance described by changing plasma potassium, I think, there you go, the causes. So, reduced intake, what are you probably not eating enough of? Bananas. Potatoes? High in potassium? I didn't know that. Good to know. I didn't even know Daniel Boone was a real person. I thought it was like a uh, guy with the big ox. Uh, yeah, Paul Bunyan or Johnny Appleseed. Was he real? Uh, to me, they're all myths. When you, I'm telling you, geography, national history, <laughs> politics, I don't, I am clueless. Johnny Appleseed was real? Paul Bunyan. Not real? He has his own amusement park in Minnesota, doesn't he? And a blue ox. And a blue ox. Right, I hear they're extinct now. But, uh, yeah. I'm politics. Politics, I looked at the words. Poly, 
and kicks. Many blood-sucking creatures, right? That's politics. That's how I feel about it. Okay, so anyway, cause of hypokalemia, not getting enough in or losing enough. Okay, diabetics have to worry about it because the insulin is going to start sucking at the potassium in the cell and causes hypokalemia. What chemical will be popping out in your body that makes you excrete lots of potassium? What hormone? Aldosterone. So those are the major things you want to pay attention to. And then there's my banana picture. So potassium, did you see the levels? It's 3.5 to 4.5 is normal. If you go too high, just below 3.5, you go too or sorry, too high, just above 4.5 or too low, just below 3.5, you screw everything up. There's not much margin for error there. So a lot of times they won't give potassium as an IV form because it's too dangerous. It's too easy to get their blood potassium levels too high. In fact, if we want to kill somebody, we give them something called potassium chloride. So we give them this huge spike of potassium, and it makes their heart go really quick and then stop. And then they're done. Who do we give that to? Death row inmates or in laws? Right. <laughs> Damn it, that's recorded. Okay. So I'm glad my wife doesn't like to listen to me talk. Wait. <laughs> anyway. So the clinical manifestations, you want to take neuromuscular. So with neuromuscular, if you can't repolarize, you're actually hyperpolarized. It puts it in a state where what are you not going to be able to... Ah, I spoiled that. So if you're hyperpolarizing, what's that do to anything, whether it's a neuron or, say, muscle? Hyperpolarized makes it inhibited. It makes it harder to get an actual action potential out of it. So when you have hypokalemia, you start getting this weakness, this paralysis. I don't know where that speech impediment came from, but flaccid paralysis. Respiratory arrest, why? Why? Stopping your breathing. Because you can't fire the neurons going to the breathing muscles. Yep. So, I'm going to kind of put this up here. But what happens with the cell membrane, it becomes hyperborite. And it's all muscles. So think of the GI tract. You can't move the food along as fast as you should. So the food sits there too long, starts absorbing too much water, and makes you constipated. Yep. Oh, honey, you look yeah. constipated. You need a banana. <laughs> and with the banana thing, like I said, that's how they usually get it in. They so have to eat it. So it slowly goes in and regulated by the body as it's coming instead of giving them a huge dose in their blood. Right? And then dysrhythmias, what are we talking about? What organs are dysfunctional now? The heart. Yep. The heart can't fire appropriately. Um... Postural hypotension, you know what that is? Postural means when they stand up, they feel dizzy, lightheaded, and they want to drop back down. Yep. And you want to think about the muscle that's going around the blood vessels. With hypotension, they can't squeeze the blood vessels and they can't push the blood back up to their head. It's the same thing. Weakness, flaccid paralysis, weak cardiac muscle, weak skeletal muscle, weak smooth muscle. It's weakness. Weak, 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 weak. And so weak that eventually their heart could actually stop. Which is different than spiking them with tons and tons of potassium at one time, causing them basically their cell or their heart to seize up. So this is it, it just stops. And then slowly intake. And it's the opposite, hyper. So hyperkalemia. The typical causes are going to revolve around things like a kitchen. Or, I said this before, you smash a muscle, and the muscle releases all of that potassium into the blood. If you don't have insulin, you can't pull the potassium into the cells, so the potassium stays high in the blood. This is a tricky one. Addison's disease affects the adrenal gland, and it stops it from releasing what hormone? Yes. Aldosterone. Exactly. So Addison's disease, they don't have aldosterone, which means they can't absorb what? Sodium, and they can't get rid of potassium, causing hyperkalemia. Right? So those are major ones. Right, 
and then the manifestation, so are the symptoms of hyperkalemia. And then hyperactive muscles. If hypokalemia weaken the muscles, you can always count on hyper doing the opposite. So hyperactive muscles, paresthesias, GI cramping. Now their GI, now their GI tract is going overdrive. It's almost like it's cramping up, squeezing so fast that instead of having constipation, it's shooting out. Probably not shooting. Shooting was probably the wrong word, but it's moving quickly through their system. I don't know. Yeah, who knows? Maybe it could be shooting out. That would really be explosive diarrhea. So these are the early symptoms, the first signs. And then, of course, late or severe. Now their body's trying to correct that, and it's basically reversing it and making it look more like they have hypo. So it's kind of a tricky thing. Is that you have to look at the early stages and the late stages. If you saw they came into the hospital because they were have hyperactive muscles and they had diarrhea and there were lots of tetany cramping up, and then when they got there after an hour waiting for you, then they were like muscle weakness and the kidney just looked exhausted. What was probably their problem? They started with high potassium and now they have low potassium. And then again, you have to watch for the EKG situation. So dysrhythmias and potentially heart failure. And then all of them again screwing with that repolarization process. Okay, so based on what you know, what could be a treatment of hyperkalemia? You have too much potassium in the blood. What could you give them? Something that's probably on hand because of this disease. It's one of the worst, or well, like insulin, right? So you probably have insulin all over the place. If they have hyperkalemia, if you gave them a little bit of insulin, it would suck the potassium into the cells. But what else would it do to their blood? It would drop their blood sugars, right? So you better give them a nice bottle of Coca-Cola at the same time you're doing that so they have that high fructose corn syrup to go right back in. So what's going to happen to the blood pH as the body's pumping potassium to concentrate? So if the blood's pumping the potassium into the cell, guess what's getting pumped out of the cell? H plus. Yep, so as insulin's pulling the potassium in, it's also pushing the acid out. So what's going to happen to their blood as a result? Slightly acidic, acidic acid is right acidic. And then what effect could or what could you give them to kind of the effects on the heart? So if potassium um, what's the situation? Hyperkalemia. What was it doing to the heart? Going too slow or going too fast? So the first stage is going too fast. So what could you give them? It should say what well, you can actually give them what kind of a blocker to slow the heart rate down. Yeah. And I'm not going to ask you about drugs on any of the tests. This is just an idea to keep you working ahead in the future. And then winding into the last couple here. Calcium, oops, calcium, magnesium, and phosphate. And they kind of go hand in hand. Here's your calcium, what you need to know. The bulk of it's stored where in your body? Bones. Yep, so it's primarily in the bones. The smallest percentage is actually in the blood because it's a really dangerous chemical. So just like potassium, when you lift the plasma concentration, it's really small and it's really tightly regulated. And the two hormones you should remember that regulate calcium, PTH and calcitonin. Which one breaks your bone down? PTH or calcitonin? PTH and calcitonin tones the bone, so it stores it. What's the other chemical that always moves opposite the calcium? Starts with a P. Phosphate, right. So you can watch that or keep that in the back of your mind. If calcium goes up, phosphate goes down. Because if you take calcium and phosphate and put them together, they build bone. Do you want that built in your kidneys? Nope. It would cause kidney stones. Yep. Do you want it built in your blood? It would start sticking to the walls and cause hardening of the arteries. <laughs> so you don't want those things. So calcium and then phosphate. So when one goes up, the other one goes down. And then phosphate. Phosphate is important because it's part of a density triphosphate, so you need phosphate. It also helps build bone. And then the big rule of thumb there is if calcium goes up, phosphate goes down, or vice versa. The disorder is hypercalcemia, which means too much calcium. This is a tricky one. Hypercalcemia actually turns down your muscle activity. 
hypercalcin turns down muscle activity. This one's a hard one to understand because I was when I was first learning about it, I thought, well, sodium, if I have too much sodium, it gets in and it excites the muscles, it excites the, the neurons. And what causes the muscle to contract? Calcium. But there's this weird thing that happens when you have too much calcium. It actually doesn't go into the cell very efficiently. So it prevents you from getting muscle contractions. And this is just one of those paradoxical things you just have to, uh, have to memorize. So too high calcium makes your muscles weak. What's it going to do to your heart? Slow it down until it actually stops. So you don't want high blood calcium. You want to keep it regulated tightly. Having too much calcium causes things like kidney stones, constipation. Because what's it doing to the smooth muscle? Slowing it down. And when you slow down the smooth muscle in the GI tract, you get constipated. And then some of the causes. Hyperparathyroidism. Too much PTH. What did PTH do to your bones? It broke them and put the calcium where? Into the blood. Yeah. And then when we get into the increase, we'll talk a little more about hyperthyroid state. We want to focus on hyperthyroidism. That's right. Hyperthyroidism. Or what could happen with the other chemical? Calcitonin. Where did it come from? Thyroid gland, right? So either hyperparathyroid or hypothyroid. Hyperparathyroid releases too much PTH. Hypothyroid releases too little calcitonin. So it's hard for you to store that calcium. And then renal disease, you push out calcium every time you urinate. If you need more calcium, you can pull it back in. But if you have renal disease and you're not urinating out your electrolytes properly, they start accumulating. Problem. And then why excessive intake of vitamin D? What's vitamin D do to you? Makes you absorb more calcium. Right? You can eat a whole bottle of, of calcium supplement, but without vitamin D, you don't actually absorb it. You just have expensive rock hard poo. And so if you take in vitamin D, it pulls more of that calcium into your blood. Taking too much vitamin D causes problems. And then we're going to just go ahead and skip over milk alkali syndrome. Tumors. The tumors and where they happen. Typically, tumors cause excess or deficient. Excess. What usually causes deficiency? Cancer. Right. So, malignant tumors, which are what? Cancer or a tumor tumor? That's a cancer. If you have a tumor of which of these glands? That one. If you have a cancer of there, either of those situations would actually cause an increase in calcium. Okay. And then if you have cancer of the bone, why is it causing a spike in calcium? If you have cancer of a bone, what's it doing to your bone? It's destroying your bone, right? It's releasing the calcium into the blood. Technically, it's releasing calcium into the interstitial fluid, and the interstitial fluid's concentration is pushing it into the blood. And then hypocalcemia, basically the opposite. And this is an interesting effect. So calcium blocks sodium. So if you don't have enough calcium, what's going to happen to sodium? Is it blocked? It's going to fly into the cell. What's it going to do to the cell? With sodium going into the cell too fast cause? Excitability. So if hypercalcemia turned down excitability, what's hypocalcemia doing? Turning it up. It's going to cause muscle spasms. It could cause tetany. What, uh, what, muscle, what muscle would you be most afraid of tetany happening at? Heart or respiratory? Right, because either of those could actually be fatal. So things that are overactive, muscle cramps, convulsions, seizures, the tetany, overactive tissue. And here's an overlap is the renal failure because it can cause either way. If the re if the kidneys stop screening things, but at the same time you flow through nephron and everything starts leaking out, you can actually lose too much calcium. Here's just the opposite. If increased vitamin D causes hyper lack of cause hypo. And then same thing. Suppression of parathyroid or hyperscution of calcitonin. 
What's malabsorption referring to? Mal nutrition, yeah. It's basically malnutrition. So either you're not getting the right nutrients or you're not able to absorb the calcium. What do you need to absorb calcium from your GI tract? And so here's some signs. I don't know how to pronounce the guy's name, so I'm going to try it. So it looks like an Eastern European person, and I've never heard anybody actually say it out loud. But what's interesting is that because of the imbalance in the nerve, if you start tapping over the facial nerve, it actually starts causing misfiring in this, and they'll start twitching their face, and everything's controlled by it. So around the eye and on the side of the face. So if you tap over this, it misfires the nerve, and they start twitching. And the next one, the Trousseau sign, they actually start, I don't know how to describe this, but it start curling their hands up. It's almost like their hands are cramping up because they're not getting adequate flow of nutrients down to their muscles and so their mu muscles are basically going to tighten. And I'm not going to put that on a test. It's just interesting signs. Hyperphosphatemia. Where would you usually see that? When you see hypocalcemia. Yeah. So high phosphate related to low calcium. And a lot of times you get whatever caused hypocalcemia will also cause hyperphosphatemia. It's like kidney failure. Since phosphate's higher in the cells, if you start destroying cells, it releases potassium, it releases phosphate. And this an example. ATP is in triphosphate. And then the laxatives, the way that laxatives work actually on calcium, phosphate, and magnesium is the problem, but that's more of a pharmacology issue. So the best way to think of hyperphosphatemia is look at what other disorder? Hypocalcemia. Which, right through here. So, similar symptoms as hyperphosphatemia. Hypophosphatemia would be like hyperphosphatemia. Magnesium. Magnesium's tricky because what magnesium will do is magnesium will actually bind the transporter for, for calcium. So if you have too much magnesium, magnesium is typically inside the cells, but if it gets overabundant, it actually goes to these little calcium transporters and plugs them up. Like goo. So it's clogging the holes. And most people that have problems with magnesium, oh, most people that have problems with magnesium are usually people that are taking too many like um, tums and like antiacid situations. So normally, magnesium allows everything else to work properly. So the muscles can excite properly. It's actually there to help regenerate like DNA to make red blood cells, to make skin cells. But the problem is, like I said before, they can actually stick to the calcium receptors. So if you have too much magnesium, it binds the, the calcium receptors and doesn't let them transport it. So what organ of the body are you going to have the most problem if you have too much magnesium? Or you're going to life threatening problem, is what I should say. I have to be careful where I put my hands because I actually point it at it. What muscle? Heart, right. So if you get too, mag too much magnesium and start blocking the calcium channels to the heart, your heart can't move calcium properly and you're done. Ixnay on the lift scale. And I think that's pig Latin for stop living. Okay, so hypomagnesia, and then what you want to look at is symptoms of hypocalcemia or hy hypokalemia. <coughs> And then, like I said before, magnesium actually inhibits potassium and calcium channels. And then the last one, hypermagnesium, just the opposite. And then I put this one slide in here. Oops, I don't know why I keep saying that. I put this one slide in here so it's kind of a summary. So the key characteristics, and then if you notice with each of them, Looking at the serum levels. Where's serum? What are they talking about? 
the blood, yeah. So always looking at blood as a reference. So the reason you don't want to be tricked or how you don't want to be tricked is by... Uh, I know snowman's neat and all, but... Is that when I showed you potassium, I showed you two levels. I showed you intracellular and I showed you extracellular. Which one should you actually focus on? The extracellular, because that's referring to the blood. Wow, we only have 15 minutes. So we could probably... You know what I'm going to do? Screw it. I'm going to... I'll record... The acid base and just put it online with next week's stuff. So it's not that bad. Acid base, most of this you already know, actually. And then you pass out the homework. Ah, uh, never mind. I'll start on because let me answer some of the questions you Like this. Here's the first kind of question. I know this is one of the homework questions, but when you look at the pH scale, acid base we're talking about the acids compared to the bases, you have an even number of both, what do they say you have? Acidosis, alkalosis, or neutrality? Neutrality, very neutral. When you look at the pH scale, it starts from zero, it goes all the way up to 14. The closer you are to zero, the more acidic. This is what screws with me. I hate this. I wish scientists would always just like make perfect sense, but here's one time they don't. They take this logarithmic scale, and they made this huge complication and they said, the more acid you have in a solution, the lower the pH number. So if something is extremely acidic, is it going to be closer to 14 or closer to zero? Zero. The second thing you have to remember is this is a logarithmic scale. So it goes by 10, multiples of 10. Your blood is going to be about 7.4. So if you go from 7.4 to 6.4, how many times more acidic is my blood? Ten. If I go from six point or sorry seven point four to five point four, how many times? There's the tricky part. It's a hundred. So it's ten times ten. So it's ten times the seven seven six, and then six to five is another ten. Ten to four hundred. So think about this. If your pH of your stomach is a two, and I'm just going to use your blood being seven to make life simple. How many times more acidic is your blood, or sorry, your, your stomach than your blood is? So if we go 7 to 6, it's what? 10. From 6 to 5, it's 100. From 5 to 4, 1,000. To 3, 10,000. To 2, 100,000 times more acidic. So your stomach acid is 100,000 times more acidic than your blood is. So why is it we take something like milk and magnesium with a pH of 10.5 to neutralize it in a super acidic stomach? What do they do? Right, it starts to neutralize it. So the more base I put in here, the less acidic the environment comes. It neutralizes these acids. It makes them more steady, closer to neutral. Uh, when we look at the term, anything that's called acid is a hydrogen donor. I always look at hydrogen on the at table and it's this one little tiny chemical, the very first chemical. The only thing that hydrogen has in this whole entire world is one electron for this negative charge. If I take away that electric <coughs> negative, what happens to hydrogen? If I take away its negative, what does it become? Positive. So positive is not as a happy positive attitude. Positive is because it's pissed. It's royally pissed. You took away the only thing that hydrogen had in this world. How's it going to treat other things? Very angrily, right. It's going to go to other things and try and destroy them. It's looking for its teddy bear. I always think of it that way. Hydrogen's like this little teddy bear. It's all it has. You come along, you pluck one off, it's, ha it's not happy at all. It's angry, and it's going to pay. You know, pay it forward. It's going to take off something else, which takes off something else, which takes off something else. Thanks. So anything that's an acid actually throws that hydrogen out into the solution without its teddy bear. It's like pulling a pin out of a grenade and throwing it out into the blood. Right? Bases accept the hydrogen. They say, I accept you hydrogen, I have an extra teddy bear. So what's it going to do for the hydrogen? Make it less angry. Yeah, it makes it less toxic. So bases neutralize. Unfortunately, bases, if you get too many bases in an environment, they're like, God, all these teddy bears are so heavy. And, and then they cause problems too. So you want to keep a nice even balance where the ones wanting the teddy bear are even with the ones that have too many. 
So when they talk about it, they say that they're hydrogen acceptors or they donate this thing called a hydroxyl group. So if I put an OH negative next to an H plus, what do you think they're going to do? They make water, exactly. They neutralize each other, they make H2O. Dihydrogen monoxide. That nasty stuff in water fountains. Right. And then when you look at the term strong or weak, strong means that they dissociate or they break into things way, way too easy. Strong acids, if I take a hydrogen and chloride and put it in water, they go to separate ways really quick. Or I steal some teddy bear and lose them all. So these are really dangerous. Anywhere you see something that's a strong acid is a toxic environment. Where do you see hydrochloric acid? In the stomach, yeah. So other times, things like this is called sodium hydroxide. It has that hydroxide group on it. This isn't a strong acid, it's a strong base. Because what it does is it makes lots of this hydroxide group. Uh, let's see. And then we we can only partially dissolve. Things like lactic acid. If you get too much of it, it's bad, but if you're exercising and you're like, ah, oh, I'm tired, you've got some lactic acid there, it's not toxic and it's not gonna kill you. It's not gonna eat you like hydrochloric acid would do. But it slowly starts causing problems. And then carbonic acid is another one. And we'll talk about that when we talk about respiratory system. I already mentioned this. If you like seeing things visually, every time you go from one number to the next, how many times do you increase that? So if I move it from 8 to 9, where did I do the acid level? I decreased it by 10 times. And then some magic numbers you want to kind of keep in your mind are going to be 7.4, because what is that? Why is it important? That's blood pH, the average blood pH. The next one, 6.8, is that acidic or basic? Very acidic. 6.8 is the point of death. So if your blood goes down to 6.8, you're a goner. And the last one is 8.0. Is that acidic or basic? too basic. Yep, it's too alkaline. If your blood hits 8.0, you're gone. So, the reason this is so important, and why that's so delicate, 7.4 is the normal. If you just go up to 8, you're dead. It's important because most of the chemicals in your body work at a specific pH. If you take them out of that pH, they don't work anymore. So, things like um, hemoglobin. Hemoglobin carrying oxygen. If you put it in a different pH, it doesn't carry oxygen anymore. Okay? makes it really hard to breathe. So, the way that you transport proteins that move sodium, potassium, chloride, they're made out of proteins. Those proteins, just like in a clear egg white, when you cook them, you heat them, you introduce them to acids, they change their shape. Do they change back? Nope. If you change them too much, they're changed permanently. If I take an egg, and I take a hot sizzling pan, and I take a cold, ice cold bowl of hydrochloric acid, and I take an egg and I crack it in the pan, what's it going to do? The clear part turns white. Does it ever turn back? Nope. If I take the, another egg and I crack it into that ice-cold hydrochloric acid, guess what happens to the egg white? Well, the clear part of the egg. It turns white. Is it going to change back? Nope. It's the same situation. Those albumins are going through your blood. If your body gets too hot, what's going to happen to those albumins? They start changing their shape. They'll start clumping. They'll cause all kinds of problems. And think of it this way. If they're clumping, they have these little tiny gritty particles. What organ in your body is going to try and clear those out of your system? Yep, and can the kidneys efficiently clear protein? Nope. So what's going to happen to those screeners? They're going to be clogged up. Yep. They're going to cause problems. The same thing with the proteins on the surface of cells. Think about neurons. If I change the temperature of those proteins and the pump doesn't work anymore, what's going to happen to my ability to move sodium and potassium? Not going to happen. Do I need sodium in my brain? Yeah, without sodium, what happens to my brain? It doesn't fire, right? I can't move electricity. There's no firing. So when you look at things like symptoms of acidosis and alkalosis, we'll talk about how it involves the brain and firing and proteins and enzymes, etc. And then some hormones are affected by pH too, because a lot of hormones are made out of what? Proteins. Yep. And then I already asked this question, but how many times more acidic would the blood be from 735 to 635? By the way, what do you know about this person that hit 635? They're dead. So how pH has changed in the body? There are a lot of different ways it's changed. And some of the things you need to keep in mind, lungs and kidneys. 
the two of the main organs that help you regulate pH are the lungs and the kidneys. What is it about the lungs that helps you re regulate acid? CO2. You blow out CO2, what happens to your acid level in your body? It decreases. If you hold your breath for a long time, what happens to your acid level? It goes up because it goes up with the CO2, right? And then the kidneys can regulate by pushing acid out, by not pushing acid out, or by pushing one other chemical out that's basic. By carbonate, yeah. So it can make you keep bicarbonate or make you release it. And then there already told this absolute range. May I actually put this point out a bit? A good way to think of it is 6 8 to 7 8. And where's your ideal? 7.4. Thinking about this whole CO2 thing, where would you find blood that's closer to 7.35? Systemic arteries or systemic veins? So, <laughs> what is it I'm actually asking you? <laughs> systemic <laughs> CO2, right? So, in the systemic veins, what about CO2? Low or high? High. So what about acids? High. high. So what about this number? High or low? No. Low. Exactly. So this is more the venous side of the system. This is more the arterial side of the system. You notice I stress systemic and not pulmonary. So the more CO2 you have, the lower the acid. pH. So the lower the pH. Make sure I fix that. And then where you make this stuff from, it's the impact of proteins, Carb, fat metabolism. If your liver starts breaking down protein and carbs, it's not a good process. It makes things called ketone acids. Right. If you exercise a lot, you start making lactic acid. Right. If you hold your breath, you start making carbonic acid. So these are products of things like breaking down nutrients, breathing, um, kidneys not working properly, exercising excessively, any of those things. So acids and bases are constantly being made. If they're called an, a volatile, volatile means that it can be eliminated easily. So something like this, carbonic acid, can be turned into CO2 gas and just breathe it out. Non-volatile, these are hard to get rid of. These are usually floating in your blood, like sulfuric acid, phosphoric acid. These are usually products based on diet. So they're kind of crappy. And those are usually regulated by the kidneys. Where would this be regulated? By the lungs. Three processes you need to know, and if you have physiology with me, I'm going to try to taught you the physiology. Three processes, and you know need to know the order. The first one is called the chemical buffer or the blood buffer. This happens immediately. These chemical buffers are fast. You make an acid and then boom, it neutralizes it. But the problem is, if you make lots of acids, these things can only keep up for so long, they get overwhelmed, and then they have to depend on a second system to get rid of things fast. What would be the second system? Respiratory. Yep. So, the chemical buffer is within seconds. The respiratory system, within minutes. Potentially hours. And then the third one is going to be the kidneys, the renal system. So it's that order, exactly. Chemical buffers or blood buffers, the respiratory system, and then the renal system. Right. And then buffers. Buffers are just things that neutralize acids or bases. It doesn't have to be an acid. It can be if the bases get out of, out of control, they grab all the base. And usually what they'll do is they'll take like a strong acid and they'll neutralize it. They'll calm it down and make it a weak acid. So a strong acid is like an acid out there floating around with Lots of teddy bears missing. It's really, really angry. You give it one, is it still angry? It had lots of teddy bears missing, but you gave it one. Yeah, it's happier, but it's still a little ticked off. So it just became a little bit weaker. It's a little easier to deal with. That's what buffers do. They kind of calm down the acids, and they calm down the bases so they're not too dangerous. And then one of the most important ones is called the bicarbonate buffer. This one's important because it takes things like CO2, and it turns it into carbonic acid, and then finally frees up into an acid and a base to get neutralized simply. It's called the bicarbonate buffer system. I don't know if it's important or not. I just think about it. A couple exclamation points there. But yeah, it's the most important one in the system.
In fact, when you're talking about acid-base regulation, you take a blood sample, you actually look at these parts. You look at bicarbonate, you look at CO2, and you look at where they are as far as balance. Which is the part I'll probably have to put in the video lecture. Because we only have two minutes, and I think we're at a good transition place. Oh, I'm sorry, no we're not. Don't close yet. So, phosphate buffer, all you want to remember on this, intracellularly, where's it happening? Inside the cells. That bicarbonate buffer is actually happening all around the blood. Phosphate's actually inside of cells. Protein buffer, also inside cells. Proteins are important because they're made out of things called amino acids. This side's acidic, guess what the amino side is? Basic. So when you make this long chain of Legos, you always have a top on one end that's basic, and you have this acidic part on the other end. So if I have an acid that comes in, it'll stick to the base part. If I have a base that comes in, it sticks to the acid part. So it can buffer either way. And your cells keep the acid base regulated because of these proteins. And I mentioned this one. So respiratory mechanisms. Respiratory fixes volatiles, the gas ones. What's the gas that you're revolving around? CO2. And then here's that equation you probably saw in your physiology class in there. CO2 plus water, carbonic acid, and then like bicarbonate and acid. And you can, you can neutralize these very easily. So if I have an abundance of acid and bicarbonate, it goes through the other way, makes CO2, and just blow it out with the water. So it's always keeping it right there at that homeostasis, that perfect balance. And then one minute to do the kidneys, and we're out of here. So kidneys, is this the first or the last? It's the last. If something's wrong with the, with the uh, chemical buffers, if something's wrong with the respiratory, or you're just overwhelming both of them, then the kidneys kick in. So if I'm eating a high-protein diet and I'm breaking down and making lots of these acids, I'm not going to be able to blow out all those non-volatile acids I just made, so what's going to have to kick in? The kidneys. What's going to happen to my urine? If my blood is becoming too acidic because I have, I'm eating so much protein, my urine is going to become acidic because I'm trying to get rid of it out of the body. If I'm not eating very many proteins, I'm eating mostly vegetables, guess what's going to happen to my, my urine pH? That's basic because of what's going on in the blood. It's also slightly basic. Yeah. That was it. So I'll put the last... The last section just talks about what happens with acidosis, alkalosis. So, are we supposed to do the quiz? Yep, do quiz number two, because I don't think acid base is on there. And, but, and the homework that I handed out, yep. And it's like half multiple choice and then half fill in the blank. I think the last question is a really short case study. Real short, though. Do I have the, um, have the what? Mm -hmm. I don't, because I submitted it, but they didn't give me the final approval for it. But what I will do is I'll just post when the test dates and stuff are. And the grade scale. Because those are like the two most important things, right? So, yep, and that, I'll send you an email reminder too. Lance will actually put the videos for next week in a file that says genetics videos. And I'll make sure that this acid base one is the very first one in it. And then you watch those with a piece of paper. I will tell you literally what to write down, and then you just write the answer, which was most likely the slide before. Okay. And then when you bring in that way, I know you did it, and that's the homework. And what are you going to do with the